Folks, we apologize for uh, technical difficulties. We're not going to be able to use YouTube tonight, so maybe just call around or send a message out to folks and let them know that YouTube is not working for us tonight. But we'll do, be doing this on, on Facebook. Let's say a prayer, and we'll get right into talking about how we talk to millennials and how we even ourselves understand the issue of global warming or global change. Let's, so let's talk about that. Lord, uh, we worship you tonight and just pray that you will be with us. Uh, we pray for uh, technical ability, Lord God, in your hand upon this message that uh, our congregations will know how to work with uh, the youth and, 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 in fact, the whole world, the community, in uh, concerning global warming, global change, and those things that you say in your word about these things. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So we're in the midst of the COVID-19, and the numbers keep going up in some states and keep coming down, and, and I'm going to be frank with you. I don't think the scientists really have a handle on this. It's very interesting that we've heard some uh, scientists. Uh, there's one big book out on the Spanish flu, and how they handled that, and he's given his advice now to um, Fox News and others, and and really, to be frank, that the, the the doctors and the scientists really don't know what to do. Do we wear a mask? Don't we wear a mask? At first, we didn't wear a mask, and then we went we went to wearing a mask, and now we're hearing the masks are dangerous even to ourselves, and so it's a very interesting thing what is happening in the world. God is the only wise God. He's the only one that really knows. And science is his science. And so when we talk to people about these things, one of the main things that's going to be happening is this idea of using global change or global warming to bring all the nations under one umbrella that's been happening for the last, two, I'd say, two decades and maybe even more. NAFTA had some things to do with that. And so... The, the millennial, I believe that the younger generation in particular is really being duped, it's, especially if they're going off to colleges, they're really being fed some bad information. And it's really up to the church to talk about these things and get on these things. We've, now we've got, if it wasn't COVID-19, we've got the Asian hornet invading Washington and, and uh, you know, how we're going to take care of those. You remember we've got the locust problems in Africa and... Um, the Sinai Peninsula down south there and moving into Pakistan and China. And they're saying that this is going to be one of the worst ones in 70 years, if not more. Or just this is the second birthing of these things just this year. And so um, it's, it's just a, a very interesting time for all of us. How do we understand these things? And is it really just climate that is changing? Because, folks, listen. If we, can, um, if we can understand that it's not just the climate, then we possibly um, could, could talk to the other generations and other people in, in um, understanding these things and what the Bible says about them. So, is, is it global warming? Is the globe warming? Is that even the right question? Uh, we, we see, to be frank with you, I was a weatherman in the uh, United States Air Force for uh, quite a few years, and uh, the weather still interests me. There has been significant changes. There have been some warming. There have been some other things happening we're going to look at. But is it just that? Is it just the, the changes in weather? Um, last year... I think this was 2019, if I remember right. The temperatures in Canada's Saskatoon dipped 45 degrees, breaking a 112-year record. And at one point, 75% of the U.S. was freezing in January. The West broke dozens and dozens of records. And then this last winter, we broke records again. And in fact just in the news today that there's going to be very cold weather breaking into the United States and, and uh, Eastern Canada, and it's going to be breaking more records. So the word, again, we've, we've brought it up several times, and we're, we haven't coined it. We're just kind of using it, the word unprecedented, that things continue to be unprecedented. But 
I remember hearing from the old gentleman at home that um, our bay used to freeze over and those kinds of things, which, which doesn't really happen anymore. So there are changes in global weather patterns. There's always global change. And in fact, the, the progressives, can we use that term? And I think it's Saul Alinsky who, termed, who coined those phrases. He said, don't use the word um, Democrat or Republican or socialism especially and communism. He said, use the word liberal and progressive. The progressives um, want to change the term from global warming to global change because it's more all-encompassing and it's more acceptable and kind of like the LGBT thing and uh, some of these other things they try to to get the masses to to understand it and 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 accept it and folks um, there is always global change but the interesting thing is the records that are being broken in the last several years. You remember 2017, Hurricane Harvey came across the coast and hit Corpus Christi and broke all kinds of records. 51 inches of rain, um, $198 billion in damage, 27 trillion gallons of water. It was that same year that they had Irma, uh, which, uh, which went to 185 mile per hour winds in the 33 hours, which has never been done before. The second, it was the second highest wind, winds ever recorded. Earliest, it was the earliest hurricane. They had three hurricanes at once, which was rare. That's happened before. The last time was 2010. But the only time that there's only twice that there was only four storms. And so that's something to keep, keep ahead of. But, but the interesting thing was last year and the year before that they kept having record numbers of storms, tropical storms in the Pacific and the Atlantic at the same time. And so those are, those are records that keep being broken and weather records concerning rain amounts and temperatures, those kinds of things. You've heard what's been happening in Australia the last couple of years, record droughts, record high temperatures, and now they're uh, getting uh, record low temperatures and, and things like that. So, so things just keep being broken. Unprecedented is the term. Uh, I went back and um, just seemed like the West is always catching on fire. I'm, the last few years, driving out to the West Coast and seeing seeing the folks out there and the and um, some, something's always on fire. And California, it seems, is always on fire. Look at, the, look at these numbers here. These are the top five uh, um, uh, firestorms, I guess, I guess you can say, the deadliest fires. The top five deadliest fires in California. And look at the years. It starts in 2003. And it goes to 2012, and 2013, and 2017, and 2018. And so the numbers just keep ratcheting up in California. But it's not just the weather, it's not just the fires, uh, it's not just the temperatures, but look at the number of tornadoes. Record numbers of tornadoes in, in the wintertime. What's really interesting, and I was kind of, a, I'm a kind of a, uh, again, like I told you, it's kind of a weather buff, and, went through the Doppler radar school in, Air Force, in the Air Force, and, and it's interesting to watch these things and the numbers that are calculated as we go into 2000 here. Um, but just this last week, there was some news. The tornado death toll for 2011 stands at 537 as of June 17th, making it the deadliest year for tornadoes since 1936. So 2011, I'm going, I went back and got this news. 2011 was the deadliest um, year for tornadoes. Um, this year, there have been 595 filtered reports. Now, what that means is they've been reported and filtered, but they're not officially documented as tornadoes yet. 
but there's almost 600 this year already in 2020. And we're just in to April. Tornado season still, I mean May, we're still, we're still coming into the middle part of tornado season. 73 tornado related deaths have confirmed all in the United States, thus making 2020 season the deadliest in the country since 2011. The preliminary count of 351 tornadoes in April is the second most for any April on record, according to the National Weather Service. And 14 separate killer tornadoes touched down the fifth most in National Weather Service, according to history, taking 40 lives. There were 32 tornadoes on Easter Sunday. So a very, very interesting year. And again, the numbers seem to be going up. Those are tornadoes. Remember the difference between a tornado is it's on land and it's small. Hurricanes are huge. They need warm water. And the temperatures in the Caribbean in particular and the East Coast, along the East Coast, have been going up. And the weather patterns have been very, um, very favorable to hurricane development as the years go on. And you can see the numbers keep going up for major hurricanes as well. But it's not just the hurricanes and tornadoes, but it's the Arctic Sea ice. You've seen reports over the last several years that we're losing the ice in the north. And it's really interesting that just, I think it was two months ago, that there was a report that the sea ice has actually increased this last year in the north. But this was the last, this was over a 10 year period um, prior to the, uh, this last winter. But at, at the same time, there has been an increase in the Antarctic ice. And you don't really hear that reported too much in, in the news. So what is happening? Global change. The, the, the rotation of the Earth, the, 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 actually the magnetism and the work of the sun, there's, we're coming into a solar minimum, which is, plays a significant uh, amount. Um, the solar activity plays a significant amount of, of magnetic activity on the Earth, and it changes um, our weather patterns, it changes our electricity, the way our electrical grids work, and all that kind of stuff. But one of the interesting things that people don't really understand, and, and, and nor do we pay attention to, is the fact that the, the core of the Earth, and the magma, and the breaking of the plate um, on the, the planet Earth, changes things and it actually changes for the firstly it changes magnetic north and magnetic north is always changing but this last year it changed much much faster than the scientists had documented they have um, they have formats and, and grids to, to find out where magnetic north is going to be at a certain point in time but it broke all their all their models and um, and this caught them by surprise. What changes the magnetic north, magma, and earthquake activity, which leads us to something that's, that we need to understand so that when we talk to the younger people, when we talk to other folks, that it's not just the weather. See, if it's just the weather, then what we want to do is say, well, it's the emissions, it's the amount of uh, fuel, that we're burning on the earth, it's the amount of fires, it's the amount of force that we're burning on the earth. <laughs> Some people are gonna say it's the amount of the number of cows and the cow farms and the super cow farms that we have on the earth. Can I say folks that that is actually ridiculous? That uh, we have to understand something that trees and, and, and plants, they use carbon dioxide and they change it to oxygen. And so, like one farmer likes to say here, he's a, he's a farmer in our church, an elder here, and he says, well, then that means we should have, we probably should have more, more plants and more trees. And um, the farmers up here in the, the Midwest are doing well, except for the amount of rain. We've had quite a bit of flooding going on. It's not, it just doesn't have to do with global warming or, or weather change. It has to do with things like this that change that are beyond weather patterns. 
It's beyond the idea of, of the air temperatures and sea ice and those kinds of things. This is internal to the Earth's crust. And so uh, a few years ago, you remember the Ingenuity Films put uh, the movie out called The Con Coming Convergence. And what they did was they went, they set a team to get the USGS's uh, earthquake data. And they said, well, let's start with a significant you know, earthquake. A, a 6.0 is a pretty significant earthquake, depending on where it's at. Remember this, that in the East Coast, where they really don't have earthquakes, and they don't worry about them too much, if you have an earthquake there of 6.0, it's going to break basements, and it's going to rattle windows and stuff like that. In LA, uh, they're going to be ready for a 6.0 in general. Um, but a 6.3 is a significant quake. And remember, a 6.0 and a change to a 6.1, 6.0 to 6.1 is 10 times greater. It's 10 times greater. If it's 6.0 to 6. Oh, to a 7.0, it's 100 times greater, the, the, the magnitude of the quake and the, the effects of the quake. It is exponential. So they figured that they would take a 6.3 uh, and they would start there and they would document the number of quakes since 1900 and on. And this is what they came up with. Now, I would encourage you to go watch this movie, The Coming Convergence. It's, it's, a, it's a good movie. But you can see the increase uh, of the numbers of quakes there since 1900, or 1920. Um, I've done a little bit of um, data mining myself, and I don't really want to go through this just to say, you know, I'm just going to say, say this, though. Anything before, be, before uh, 1900, the major quakes in general are really estimated because they didn't have seismographs then. Uh, the seismograph wasn't invented until I think 1935, uh, Richter invented it. And so these, the, you can see the increase of the number of quakes through the years. But again, before 1935, it's really hard to uh, estimate how many quakes were happening, let's say during the time of Christ and those kind of things. But what we can look at is just take a, a, a shot of, uh, of the last few years, for instance. Look at 1950 to 1975. There were 16 8.0 earthquakes. And then it went down a little bit between 1975 and 2000. And by the way, I have a, there's a wonderful clip out there. Most of those quakes around there, and especially before, happened right around the time that um, uh, Israel was becoming a nation. It's very interesting. Um, and then uh, between 20 and, uh, 2000 and 2020, there's been 16 earthquakes. There's been 10 between 2010 and 2020. So we're on a, uh, on a, a path of blasting these records for the last uh, few uh, 25 year periods there. So we'll see what happens in the second half of this year. We're not even halfway through 2020. Uh, look at, this is the interesting thing to me because we, we have a tendency to look at the big quakes and like I said, Ingenuity Films went to 6.3, and there's been a significant increase there. There seems to be some increase in 8s and on and above. But I'm going to suggest something here, and that is going by what Jesus Christ said. There seems to be a progression of things that started when he spoke 2,000 years ago, and then on, on up. And we'll get to those, that, those verses in just a minute here. But th this is... This is 5.0 quake. The quakes in this is these are worldwide quakes since 1935. These are 5.0 and above. Now these, first of all, most of these, most of all the quakes in, in the world are in the ocean, so nobody pays attention to them. Nobody really cares about them. And nobody really cares about 5.0s. But they are a, a signal of what Jesus Christ has said. You can see but since 1935 that the number of just moderate quakes, and you can see the increase, it's, 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 it's doubled. 
It's at least doubled since 1935, the number of 5.0s. I, I want to show you something. This is right straight out of the USGS data. In 2009, this is a, these are 4.0 to 4.9s, so just below 5.0. Again, moderate quakes and nobody cares. But here, 9,000, about 9,000 happened in 2009. And in 2018, almost 15,000 happened. Now, there was a decrease in 2019. I just, just I've had this stuff up. Um, I, I just looked at that data. There was a little bit of a decrease, but now in 2020, there's already an increase. And so we're gonna see what, how this plays out in 2020. But you can go back and look at the scale that it just it just keeps going up. There's dips and then it keeps going up, and that's what's interesting. See, this has nothing to do with weather. This has nothing to do with the temperature of the waters, and has nothing to do with how much ice is melting in the north or in the south. This is a an earth a, a crust and molten events that are happening. Now, what does that mean? That over time, things are just going to come to a significant convergence at some point. And that's why Jesus said, he even said 2,000 years ago, he told his disciples to watch. And he told them to watch in, in all the way through the centuries since then. And we've watched these things coming. Nobody really cares about earthquakes because they really don't affect us. But Jesus Christ uses those and some other things that we'll look at here as something to watch as time goes on. Here's some interesting data. Here's the world population. And again, it's really interesting to me but that about 1950, things change. The earthquake number changed, the world population shot straight up, the, the number of all kinds of things changed uh, right around that time. It was right after the war, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Here is uh, the number of marriages and divorces in the United States. You can see, again, this has nothing to do with the global weather patterns. This has to do with humanity, that the number of marriages are going down. Even though our population is, still goes up and it's not going up as much as it should, and we'll talk about those in a second, but look, look at the number of marriages are, kind of, are going down and the number of divorces are going up. Now, uh, in the last few years, the, the number of divorces have gone down because the number of marriages has gone down. So when you don't have marriages, in general, you don't have kids. And so this is the, the number of births through the Western nations. You can see France and Britain and Italy and Germany and Japan there and Japan, uh, uh, United States is in the red. And you have to be, if I remember right, you have to be at 2.1 or 2.2 to make, I think at 2.0 you stabilize your, your population, and at 2.1 to 2.2 you're, you're growing uh, in your population, and we are um, right at that number. And I will say this, uh, it, it, the, his, the Hispanic, um, population in the United States is the one that's keeping us at 2.0 right now. I think the Caucasian population is down to 1.6 or 1.8 or something like that. And the black population is about 2.0, I think. But the, uh, the uh, Hispanics are above 2. They're having more children than the, the rest of us. So, um, that brings us to this kind of an idea. Because see, now when you start talking about, if you, if you start talking to millennials about this situation, if you begin here, they're gonna say, what's wrong with this? But if you build this idea that it's not just the weather, it's the earthquakes, it's the number of marriages, it's everything that really the Bible talks about is good, is going south. And so this is the, um, they favor or oppose same-sex marriage. The dark blue oppose same-sex marriage. 
And then right at about 2011, they accepted it. And I want to point you back to the, to the year that President Obama changed. He says he changed his view and accepted same-sex marriages at that point or just, just before. I know it was a year or two before 2016. And there's, a, there's something happened in this time frame in the United States. That's why the president is, is responsible Leaders are responsible for the way their nations uh, are taken. It interests me that the Bible says that the, the nations are going to be judged at the valley of Jehoshaphat. And so the Lord is actually going to judge nations and rulers of those nations there. And we're going to see another verse that concerns that as well. But along with the population growth and not having kids, I put this together. Uh, I think about a year ago. Now, a couple of these leaders have changed. Theresa May is not in there. Boris Johnson has some kids now in the UK and, and a couple others. But at one point, look at the leaders of the EU. France, United Kingdom, Scotland, Italy, Germany, Luxembourg, Sweden, Netherlands, and the EU Commission. All of them did not have kids. All these leaders in the EU or in Europe did not have kids. This is not biblical. This is, this is not right. This is a strange thing. Now, on top of this, you have these people telling the rest of the world how we should act, how, she, how we should um, keep the population down, and how we should control the population, and how we do these other things. You noticed the uh, last couple weeks I've been talking about Macron. He has no kids, and yet he wants to tell us how we're supposed to um, talk, uh, we're supposed to control, I guess, our populations, and it's it's a very interesting thing, uh, what these leaders are doing. It's one thing to uh, to uh, to try to control your own nation and try to do things for your own nation, but these people are out to change the world, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, but. Again, when you're talking to the younger generation and those people out there who are so focused on global change and global warming, there's so much more going on behind the scenes. People aren't getting married. And you can say, well, they're afraid of the, of the global change and not enough food and all these other things. Well, okay, so let's bring up the earthquake issue because that has nothing to do with global warming. And there's a lot more behind that as well. Let's talk about Russia for a second. This is a, uh, a map of Russia and China, South Korea, France, and the United States. And they are um, building nuclear plants around the world. And Russia is building 39. China's building 15, South Korea is building 6, France is 10, and the United States is 2. Russia, Russia's economy is built on this. It's built on fossil fuels, oil. It is built around selling arms and munitions to different countries, mostly terrorist countries. And it's built around... Um, building nuclear reactors for other people who, by the way, use it um, to enrich uranium for uh, nuclear weapons. And that's really where Iran is going as well. Russia right now is building its second, second nuclear reactor in Iran right now. So, so we have these nations who are reaching out beyond their borders to try to really control those things that, were, that are beyond their borders and enrich themselves. China and Russia are in the lead. Now, what's interesting here, this just came out a couple days ago. The U.S. is losing the nuclear energy export race to China and Russia. So this map here, I got, I think it was, um, yeah, two years ago, July 2018. And here, Trump is concerned about this today that China and Russia are exporting their nuclear energy 
to other nations. What does that have to do with global change? It has nothing to do with global weather change or global weather patterns. It is important to get the attention of, of everybody, especially during these times. If we, know, if we understand these things that we're talking about here, when we discuss the Bible and what is to come, people can understand what has happened in the past and what is going to happen, and then you can give them hope of the gospel in Jesus Christ, because he said, he was the one who said that these things would come. This is a very interesting map here. This is the global deaths in conflict. So in other words, in, other words, in wars, since the year 1400. And you can see 1400, you got a bunch of little dots, and then you can just see the number increase. To the 30-year war in 1618, the Neo-Polonic, uh, Neo I'm sorry, Nap Napoleonic Wars, thank you Austin, in uh, 1800, and then to First and Second World War, which again, I want to suggest, are probably one and the same. They really, the First War really never ended. Now, right after that, the nations got together, and this is important to understand. The nations got together with the UN, the United Nations, and, and all of these um, leagues, the League of Nations and all those other kinds of things, they all come together so they can bring world peace. And that's what's happening during this. They're trying to control war and those kinds of things. Well, they're doing a better job of it than they were in World War I and World War II, but if you think about it, we're still not doing really well. There's still a lot of war out there. But what's, what has increased and what cannot be changed is the states that have conflicts in them. These are state-based conflicts since 1946. These are basically civil wars. And you can see that that number just keeps going up. It, it uh, went up to 1990, it took a dip there, and in, 19, and in 2016 it has skyrocketed again. And this Today, the, uh, it, it interests me that before this pandemic hit, there were lots and lots. There was protesting in Lebanon, protesting in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran, in China, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, and in France, and other countries. We've had a few here in the last several years. They all kind of calmed down when the COVID-19 hit, the Wuhan virus, I call it. And, when the, and then this last week, many of them flared up again. Hong Kong flared up again. Protest in Wuhan themselves has flared up. Uh, and in that provident, uh, providence, or province, I'm sorry. And then um, also increased again in in Syria and especially in Lebanon. There was a run on banks actually last week in Lebanon because of the decrease in their monies. Turkey and China, uh, especially Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Russia, and Iran, their money is really worth very, very little and it's getting worse. And so you're gonna continue to see how these people begin to starve now because of this. And in Africa and other places, um, the, uh, the food issue is going to become drastic if people in the, in the world really can't get the numbers uh, and the economy back. Now, I've heard people, and I've heard the EU, and I've heard some of our own government, especially during the Obama administration, talk about the number of these conflicts going up because of the, the global weather change. I've heard the Pope say himself that because of droughts that have civil wars and those kinds of things. And there, there may be something to that. Remember, people migrate um, because of food patterns. They've done that forever. And it's, it's a natural thing because the natural weather patterns change. And so some, um, some nations, some people move. However, 
1990, look at the significant change there. And so there's some of this that's always going on, but not this significant increase that's happened. And I'm going to say this, that since you can go back and look at all this data, and it's very interesting. I looked at the famines. I looked at the wars and earth, numbers of earthquakes and those kind of things. And you can go back and pinpoint something changed in the late 40s and especially 1947 to to 1950. Something changed. And there's huge increases uh, in this. This is 1946, and then, and then 1960, boom. It goes, it goes right up, and then it just keeps going up. And so there's a convergence of these things. When you can get a millennial, when you can get some other folks who don't understand the Bible, when you can get other, other people who are, who are concerned and afraid of these things, you can say, okay, let me just show you this pattern because this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Let me show you another pattern that Jesus said would happen. This is a decline in church attendance. Since 1994, 62%, and you can just see the numbers go down to 56, I think it was... Uh, to 50, 54% there. And I've been watching this, especially since I've been here in Yankton for the last six years, and it continually goes down. Now, we've had some really good news here in the last couple weeks, and we'll talk about that here at the end. But the, the only, I've looked at all the, the Protestant churches and, and all those kinds of things. Do you know what is the stable number for any kind of church? It's the evangelicals. The evangelicals are, um, let me read something. The evangelicals in 1972 was said to be 17.1% of Americans. In 2014, it's 22.7% of Americans. Now, in the last uh, couple, three years, I've seen that dip to about 20 or 21%. But evangelicals, whether you put it at 15 or 20 percent, um, it seems to it is a very stable number, if not just increasing just a little bit. And so that's really good news because nothing's going to shake the church of Jesus Christ. Um, the people that are coming into the church may change the numbers there. We wish it would be going up more, but it's not. But at least, at least it is stable. Along with this decline in the church, just an interesting thing on the current pope. He's the most liberal pope that has ever been uh, ahead of the Catholic Church. Um, last year, uh, the pope signed a pact with Islam declaring diversity of religions. And, it, and he said, it is the will of God. Pope Francis and Ahmad Tahib the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar signed a joint declaration on human fraternity during uh, an interreligious meeting in Abu Dhabi, UA, uh, United Arab Emirates on four, February 4, 2019. Um, if this were true, it would mean that nearly 1,400 years of scholarship by all four Sunni schools of Islam Jurisprudence would have to be thrown into the massive bonfire, bonfire. And this one article writes, until we see the smoke rising from such a fiery spectacle, it's safe to say that Tahib played the Pope for a few fool. We have to understand something, that to the Sunni and the Shia, which this man here is a Sunni, everybody else is either an apostate or a, an unbeliever. And they're both, uh, both of them, actually apostate, a Shia, is supposed to be killed, according to the Sunni. According to the Shia, the Sunnis are supposed to be killed because they're apostates. And then unbelievers or Christians, especially, um, they say the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, are supposed to be subdued. They're supposed to submit to Islam and pay taxes to Islam. And if they don't, they're supposed to be killed as well. And then of course he signed that deal with uh, a casual kiss, I guess. This is, this is not biblical and this is a 
Um, I don't know if you've been watching the news uh, and keeping track of Pope, Pope Benedict. Um, he is very, very concerned about the Catholic Church. Remember, he was the, the odds are that he was forced, forced out of being Pope and he gave it up to Pope Francis and now he said the other day that the church leaders are trying to silence him. In Revelation 19.2, it says, the Bible says, that God's judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his, his servants. He is specifically talking about the woman, I would say even a Jezebel, uh, the false prophet here. And I'm not going to go into who I think that is or any of that, but it's at some point he's going to do that. But watch what he did. Or she did. This false religion corrupted the earth with her immorality. That's what the false prophet did. Watch this verse. In Revelation 11:18. Uh, the nations raged, but your wrath came in the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. I, I'm not going to go into the number of um, fracking uh, areas in the United States. Uh, they're drilling down to get gas. They're drilling down to get oil. They're drilling down in these volcanoes to uh, warm their water, heat their water, and they get steam out, and they run turbines through that. There are millions of them in the southwest. They run, they really run from uh, Texas and Oklahoma to the west, through the Rocky Mountains and through the Cascades. Uh, there's, there's tens of thousands of small volcanoes in the southwest. We can show you uh, those at some point. All you gotta do is you use Google and zoom in on some of those areas. And then of course, up through the Rocky Mountains and the east and, and the west coast. There are, there are so many that really cannot be counted. And what they're doing is they're breaking the earth's crust. And that's along with now all this magma activity and all of these things happening. So, so man is destroying the earth. And in fact, remember the Lord is gonna come back before man destroys men. So there is this happening, but it's not global warming. It's not global, really, it's not global weather change. It is global change. It is progression in, in human beings to dominate the earth and take, try to take what is God's, and they're not going to get it, of course. Matthew 24, 3, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, that happened before 70 AD even, and they will lead many astray, and then you will hear wars and rumors of wars, see that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Now, uh, I'm, I'm told, and I understand it, from studying and, and hearing other experts, we'll call them, that the uh, you hear wars and rumors of wars. That is uh, that is a time of a converging time of things to come. But when that was happening, the end was not yet. But in verse seven, for nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is an idiom of world war. And there was, of course, we, we mentioned World War I and World War II. We're on the back side of that. And um, it's, I'll show you something here in a minute. Um, we'll see where this is going to head, according to scriptures. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning. They're the beginning of birth pains. So I believe that when people really start seeing this stuff converge, they're going to see that these are the beginnings of the tribulation, the, the summer, the time to come. What happens next, and is it going to be a convergence and a, and a carrying on, is that they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations. 
the, the numbers of anti-Semitism has, has risen in the last uh, several years dramatically, in the last two years in particular, and even against the church, uh, uh, especially in Africa and, and the Middle East. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and leave many. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. These are the things. So I'm going to suggest that this has started. This section here has started, especially since World War I, and is increasing. You saw the data there. And now we're going to see this stuff increase uh, in particular as well. I got interested in this stuff, especially... Well, I mean, I remember reading the books of Hal Lindsey, and I was in the Jesus movement in the 1970s, and we we watched Israel, uh, you know, uh, the, the Six Day War and, and night, the the Yom Kippur War, and those kinds of things happened, and we we heard Hal Lindsey talk about those things, and um, I was interested then, but in 2014, when the Navy ships of Russia began to those are Russian Navy ships coming down through the Bosporus. This is Turkey, and that's Turkey. And now they're coming down through the Bosporus because Turkey's allowing them to come out of the Black Sea. And now they're going down to Syria to set up their first warm water base in Syria, which is right about here in Latakia. And now you can see, and you, you know what happened in Syria. You know what happened, what, what, what Russia and Turkey's done there? They've, they've decimated cities, they've, they've killed hundreds of thousands, and they've displaced millions of Syrians, and it's a, it's a devastating thing. The United States is still flying uh, this area, they're still keeping some security, but they are pulling back. They've, they pulled a ton of vehicles just this last week, through the north there and brought them down to central where the oil fields are and they're consolidating their bases in Syria and Iraq. They're sending some people home. Just this last week they sent some Patriot missile batteries that were moved over to Saudi Arabia. They sent those home, uh, several of those home with the people. Um, Trump wants to bring the people home and yet he doesn't want to give up the oil fields yet and things are just a mess up here. But you can bet that Russia and Turkey will, will take care of ISIS and they're going to take care of this kind of stuff when things settle down. And it is being settled down. Just this last week, there was uh, a report of this, and there's a couple of these, but this one in particular is set up in Egypt. This is one of the largest radar systems in the Middle East, and this is a Russian radar system. It's set up right on the border of Turkey in Egypt. And they can, they can see all over the Middle East and into Northern Africa and all over the Med. Uh, so they've got a couple of these, but this one in particular can see that whole region. And it's very interesting that they're, they're, Russia is basically setting up their border, and I'm gonna put it that way, their border is is in Syria. It's on the Golan Heights. It is near Israel. They've, they've been flying flags on the Golan Heights and many of the cities. Uh, and I showed you a couple weeks ago they, they, a brand new flag in, near Deir Zor, where the United States just basically left that area. They're still in that region, but they're, they've left that area. The Russians have moved in right behind them and put their flags up. So, so they are really setting this as their border and they're gonna keep expanding. And Turkey wants to be a part of that, and so does Iran. So that's that news. That's how we should talk about these things when we're talking about uh, global change and those. It really is the heart of man. It really is the, the leaders of these nations that are causing things to change. And it's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna to lead to a very good ending for anybody, for anybody. But let's talk about some good news. In the last few weeks, um, there, this report just came out yesterday. The YouVersion Bible app saw 41 million people complete a daily reading plan up to Easter. 
and that is up 54%. And another 14.1 million people shared verses to somebody else, and that is up 30%. The Pulse Ministry, which uh, started a, a significant ministry in, in um, I believe, well, I know in Africa, I thought they were in South America as well, but Pulse Ministry says that in uh, that 1.7 million people from 167 countries across the world uh, plugged into their crusade, I think it was about two weeks ago, and 100,000 people came to Christ during that crusade. Turning Point Radio and television ministries revealed that on Easter Sunday, a staggering 90,000 people turned, uh, tuned into the online worship service. Uh, David Jeremiah said that on one day, 600 people clicked on the button to receive Christ. Greg Laurie says that uh, ever since the shutdown, viewership among millennials has increased 235%. At last count, over 31,000 people have responded to a call to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. One in five non-Christians, 21.5% polled said that crisis is causing them to start reading the Bible and listen to the Bible, uh, listen to Bible teaching and Christian sermons, uh, even though they usually don't. People are becoming more spiritual. They're more having more spiritual conversation with family and friends on Facebook and other things. 40%, 40% of the respondents said they were reading the Bible more than ever. And these are Christians. 40% more Christians are reading the Bible more than ever, watching or listening to Bible teaching and sermons as well. So this pandemic is bringing people together. And, and uh, I heard somebody the other day say, Remember what happened to 911? And after 911, there was a great increase in the number of people that went to churches, and that lasted for uh, some say three weeks, a month, whatever. I don't know. But we hope that there's a great reward for Christ coming out of this pandemic. I hope that you're doing your part, and I hope that you can talk to these things talk concerning wars and rumors of wars, concerning that we don't know what's next. We have this war on the COVID now, we have the war on the, the hornets coming in the west coast. We have the war on weather. We have the war on all these things. We don't know what's tomorrow, what tomorrow holds. But we do know that Christ said that these things were gonna increase and they're gonna come in even increasingly more. And the question is, are we gonna be afraid about it? Are, are, the question is, are we gonna stand firm? And in fact, are we gonna give hope? Listen, this is what Jesus said. He said these things are going to come, but he's coming to get us. I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, he wouldn't have told us. He told us because it's true. He's up there, and I think it wasn't it Keith Green who said uh, back in the 70s that if, um, uh, if, he's t if the Lord took six days and six nights to um, complete the earth, he'd been away for 2,000 years. Just think what heaven is going to look like for us. So it's going to be a wonderful place. And so be encouraged and take this encouragement with you. But folks, just like sin, you have to give them the bad news too. See, if there's no bad news, there's no hope. If you don't see the dirt, you can't see when it's clean. And so the Lord says, here's the bad news. There's sin, there's corruption, they're going to they're gonna destroy the earth, they're going to want to destroy mankind, but I'm going to come and stop it. I'm going to come and clean it up. And folks, it's the same way with our sin. That we are sinful and we have to come to grips with that. We have to understand and confess those sins. And once we confess them to the Lord, we say, Lord, I'm sorry for those things and I don't want to do those anymore. And I appreciate, I so much uh, give you so much thanks for dying on the cross and taking my sins away. And then he's going to come in with his Holy Spirit He's going to clean you up, and you're going to notice a change, and other people are going to notice a change, and then you're going to have this hope inside you. Paul says, we have this hope inside us. We're not of those people 
who don't have any hope. We have the complete story. So be encouraged and, and be courageous in talking to people about these things. A little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Lord, we worship you and we praise you and honor you, Lord God. We pray that you will be with us through this time. We know that you're with the church. We know that you've made promises to us. We pray as individuals that we can know your promises and that you will be with us and that we'll be able to bring other people into your kingdom so that they will be encouraged as well. We pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Be encouraged.